Making mobile magic. Now this is thoughtful. <laughs> Hello, I'm Clement Sang in Shanghai. China should be at the forefront of mobile phone marketing. After all, China surpassed the US to become the world's largest smartphone market four years ago. And the vast majority of China's mobile customers use smartphones. These devices offer advertisers a wide variety of ways to interact with customers, including location-based services, branded apps, websites, wearables, games, QR codes, Bluetooth, and more. But marketers need to be careful. Mobile phones and tablets aren't like computers or TV. These are very personal devices used for play and personal communications as much as work. Intrusive messages can be damaging to a brand's image. Are marketers here really tapping into the potential of mobile phones in China and other markets? And if so, what are the best ways to engage consumers using mobile devices and integrate mobile with other media formats? We'll find out today from mobile marketing expert Tom Eslinger, Worldwide Digital Creative Director at Sachin Sachi, who's also the author of a book called Mobile Magic. Tom. Thanks for joining us today. So let's start off with your uh, book, Mobile Magic. Okay. Uh, it's an end-to-end -end guide for marketers on the how to, why, how, and when of everything to do with mobile marketing. Um, what are some of the takeaways you know, that you can summarize for marketers today? Well, the, the, the book came from, I was um, the president of the first mobile jury at um, Canlines um, in 2012. And f after I looked through most of the work, um, we had 1,500 pieces of work, and at the, end, at the end of the day, what we were judging was a lot of it wasn't actually made for mobile. It was sort of websites that had been entered into the category, or websites that actually fit onto a phone. And I, and I thought, basing it on, on my client experience and the, the experience that we have with our staff, that maybe the, it would be a good idea to take the 15 years of experience that I had working in mobile and put it into a guide of you know the the successes and the and <laughs> and the failures of the work that we've been doing at Sochi's, and um, break it down into um, basically a handbook, or, you know, a step-by-step -step guide through how to do it. In the center of the book, one of the things that I work on with my teams is um, what I call mist, and that's when we when we go through ideas and when we're looking at concepts coming back from the brief and are they M for mobile, I for intimate, so dealing with data, is it social and at the end of it is there a transaction because we are an ad, an ad agency and we are expected to uh, you know, sell products for our clients. So that would be the center part and then I go into everything from legal to production to how to hire staff and then there's three um, case studies at the end about um, client work that we've been doing over the years. Yeah, so reflecting on this MIST acronym, I, I saw that there's a PNG type of retail, yep. um, e-commerce type of case, yes. then there's a, a Lexus content branded strategy extension case yep. study, yep. and there's also a General Mills branded content strategy. Can you speak more to those case studies? Yeah, well, I'll start with, I'll start with Lexus. Um, Lexus was, um, every year we have done a sponsorship, a content sponsorship with Sports Illustrated uh, around the swimsuit issue. And um, this year, rather than just taking out the standard um, print ad, possibly having something to do with the cover, possibly some kind of content in there, uh, we actually developed a mobile game, which was based around one of the vehicles that was, um, that was being promoted inside of, the, uh, inside of the magazine. We used the model who was appearing on the front, um, Tori, and then we actually created a racing game um, that had her involved in it, which was called the Tori 500. So not only did you have content within the magazine, you had um, the, the cover, you had inside spreads which folded out which were about the vehicle. You also had then a downloadable game which actually built in all the aspects of the vehicle so you could explore the vehicle, um, taking it right down into being able to book a test drive. So that was, that was, a, uh, that was a, a way to not use any press advertising to, or sorry, not to use any television advertising to very specifically target an audience which um, Lexus can be able to say is, you know, men who read the Sports Illustrated issue are of a certain income and a certain age, and it would also be interested in, in a Lexus vehicle. You might have seen, you know, I, I typically have episodes that talk about data programmatic, yeah, yeah. Um, and I see that this year there's the, the first inaugural creative data jury. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what were some of the learnings that you managed to extract from both the CRM piece from Sports Illustrated to the clients, you know, app engagement, 
Were you able to, to manipulate and, and discover some new insights in terms of you know, audience profiling or maybe offers, you know, programming? Or was there another case study that's really excited you in terms of how you know, brands and agencies are using data uh, to influence you know, and optimize their messaging? Yeah, I think, I think the, Lexus, the Lexus example, the thing, that we, the thing that we learned really specifically from that was that by bringing the media dollars together into a place to maximize it around a single experience, which was around the Sports Illustrated issue, very specifically, I mean, it has a time frame, right? It's 30 days that that's on the, on the, on the shelf. And then being able to time that with a vehicle launch, but also be able to time it, also be able to tie it with an app, which people are downloading, which we can then um, get data back from, see how many times they're going there, seeing what they're looking at, and then also collecting enough data from them when they want to do a test drive to be able to follow back up. So that was that was the main thing. I mean, I can't obviously talk about sales data with, with I think you've worked on vehicles before, and sometimes our clients are a little um, little sticky about that, but I think that. Um, Probably of those three cases that are specifically in the book, the the case um, that we had for P and G, where we were looking specifically at um, selling a razor, which was targeted specifically to women in Sweden, that the sales um, during this during the winter months would go down, and you know that there's many ways that you can look at why the the you know uh, women's razors might go down in the in the winter time, but they wanted to bring up the sales so that it was more consistent during the year. And that was really a data play for us and for um, the partner that we worked with because we didn't have a budget that was large enough to be able to do television. You didn't really need to do television in that case. You needed to speak very specifically to women. You needed to speak to them at a time when they were probably looking for or shopping for something that might be around beauty or health. And so what we did was we tied together um, um, Instagram where you would take a picture of how absolutely terrible, horrific your weather was outside in Sweden, so you'd be have icicles hanging out there. You'd um, take the picture, it would measure, it would measure and geotag the, um, the, the, how cold it was and what the weather was like compared to the same period last year. You uploaded that and you instantaneously got a, got a coupon which was based on the difference in temperature from that year to the next year, mm. right? So we worked with a single e-retailer, so that it was you know a point to point was very very simple. Instagram result click purchase, and you could try it many multiple times, so you could see uh, you know hey if I oh it's much colder today, so I'll see if I can get a different result. But what we also put on top of that was um, an influencer network that we brought in. Um, we had a competition in there, and we we brought their we brought their um, their sales up um, by triple figures. And in fact, they're using that as a template and a case study for how, how to be able to use social. And the best thing about that is we didn't build anything. So it was basically extracting data from the profiles of people that were shopping on the shopping site that we sponsored with, extracting data from the weather, and then taking that data and turning it into an offer. Wow. So I mean, from the 2012 jury on, on mobile, is it your opinion that a mobile first type of campaign tends to stand out because it has limited focus, limited resource, but therefore very, very laser you know, focused in terms of the deliverable in mobile? Um, I, I think that the, the one thing I learned from the jury in 2012 was that there was lots of white space <laughs> that people just weren't, they, they just weren't doing enough. We were getting lots of um, very tactical things and the last two juries have probably seen the same thing. You get quite a lot of um, kind of things that border on art projects and things that have a very limited, very, very limited lifestyle compared to the amount of dollars that you put into it. So I think one of the things that I'm really curious to see this year is how well um, mobile's actually being integrated and leading an integrated campaign, right? So that if it starts at mobile and then it, it branches out into film and you know, CRM, um, e-commerce, all those kinds of things. That's one of the reasons that I'm really interested about the amount of time I'm spending in China because of the focus here on both mobile and e-commerce. So I'm hoping that um, not only do we see something better in, in as far as, you know, use of the medium, but I also hope we see something from China this year. So and I think that's the, that's the key curl because now you have wearable technology which you know, goes through mobile via Bluetooth. Yep. You know, how, how are you feeling about, you know, wearables? How, do, how should brands position it when it comes to wearables? You know, Apple I, iWatch is out. Yeah. What, is, what is your point of view on that? Well, um, I'd have to say from being an Apple Watch owner for the last um, two and a half weeks, the main thing that I've been doing with it is 
trying to figure out how we're going to use it for marketing. And um, I mean, Android's, there's a lot of focus that's been put on Apple because it's Apple, but Android's had similar products out, not, not as comprehensive as this for quite a long time um, in, in, in internet mobile years. And um, I think that we're going to see the same thing that happened when we saw um, when mobile phones, uh, um, iPhones and more high-end phones came out. We saw a lot of really bad ideas. There were adaptations of things that um, creatives thought worked on the internet that they were trying to cram onto the phone, not taking into consideration that it is a phone. It's a very personal piece of um, gear that we carry around with us. And it also has a lot of creative opportunities aside from just um, slamming a piece of video down on somebody. I think we're going to see the same thing. I downloaded basically every single app that you could, every single mobile app that would have um, an, an Apple Watch extension on it. <clears throat> and I think that I, I probably tore off 50 of them within the, within the first 24 hours because they were, they were mobile experiences that someone was trying to cram onto, onto wearables, right? And where I think that, where I think we're going to have real opportunities is around um, having really intimate knowledge of what people are doing especially for, you know capturing pulse you know haptic movements um, you know the the behavior that people have with with this as opposed to their phone and connecting to the phone and then I think the UX is going to be really interesting like what what how do you build um, emotional states into user experience you know like when somebody's pulse goes up and um, you can tell uh, you know changes in their body how do you measure that and then try to figure out what, what kind of marketing message to push to somebody. So I think I'm, I'm super excited about wearables, but I'm, I'm that kind of geek that, you know, I'm, I'm ready to have an implant put into the, you know, back of my head so that I can, you know, pay for things more efficiently. But, but I, I, I really think that it's exciting, but I think that what, where, where I think it's going to fall over is um, even traditional creatives that, that focus on television and even traditional digital creatives I think that spend a lot of time looking at websites and web experiences and one-offs are going to have to retool the way that they think with wearables because the the experiences people do two things with mobile they, they either waste time or they save time right and this is going to sit somewhere in between so the utility end I think is going to be the part where brands are going to have the most opportunity at least in the first instance. Mm. I think, you know, in terms of China, you know, reflecting on what you just spoke about, yeah. China's even more fragmented. Yeah. Uh, and you've heard of BAT, the yeah. war between the data silos. You know, yeah. now that you're spending six months of your time in China, yeah. you know, how do you feel about the Chinese markets and how fast forward it's moving? It's got more users, it's got more developers, more players. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I mean, it's like I, I live in New York and I work, I work all across our network. And the thing that I think is really exciting about China is that it's it's got what's happening in London with you know lots of developers and art and all this all this other kind of stuff and New York and places where I'm lucky enough to work but it's but it's super ultra crazy accelerated here and it's not based around um, laptops and computers right it's based around mobile phones and it's and there's so many different and and I like the fragmentation I like the idea that there are these you know super niche markets that we need to hit you know I, I work on on uh, FMCG products for P&G. And when I'm looking at the opportunities that I go, um, oh, okay, so that's a mother that, you know, she's this age and she lives in Shanghai. And then I look at the numbers of it and I go, it's not 50,000, it's 10 million, right? And you look at these numbers and, and the numbers that we get back and it's absolutely crazy. So I think that, I think that what, what we have to do is be um, global brands coming into China need to really think that it's not, it is not a matter of taking English or Latin American copy and then just kind of like China-izing it and switching it out and being able to tell the same story that works in, in, in North America or Europe. That you really have to make it bespoke for China. And it's not just for China, it's for different regions of China and different people in China and different dialects that they speak and you know, different kinds of aspirations that they have. And I think that's like super exciting because digital is really good at that. Yeah. Mobile's super good at that, right? Yeah. And I think that's where perhaps global brands and, and brands that have a long tail heritage yes. uh, have that struggle and that difficulty with the China first strategy. Yeah. Whereas these first moves, especially in travel category, yeah. you know, you've got Tunyu, you've got all these different travel portals. Yes. They're fast moving, they've got great data. They've got no baggage and they're making that adjustment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And soon enough, you'll see Chinese you know, travel companies 
on wearable, yeah. supporting Instagram, yeah. driving traffic while you know, tourists are you know, in the US. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you get that flip type of innovation where the Chinese are moving much faster because they don't have that old school traditional heritage. Absolutely. So uh, what, what's your, do you have any trends for uh, f predictions for the, for the future? I think that I think that everything I think that everything that we're looking at right now around around mobile and wearables is going to continue to move so fast that we we don't we don't whereas and you're in advertising you know we we would we used to look at brand briefs and we wouldn't see the work for 18 months you know we'd we it wouldn't be in market for 18 we'd be working on briefs that were you know for 2017 you worked on automotive as well you'd be working on these crazy things where I'm not going to see this and now our our turnaround time is so fast. You know, it's not creatives don't have two months to go away and you know, be madmen and smoke cigarettes and you know, not that anyone would do that, but the uh, come back with a ta-da moment. I mean, it is it is it is iterative. Um, our clients want co-creation. You know, our clients want to have technology in the room when they're talking about ideas. They want to have all kinds of different people coming together in it. And I think that what the you know, advertising agencies are going to need to get closer to media companies. I mean, I'm one of the rare, I think, creative directors in the world. I love our media partners, right? I love Starcom and Zenith and everybody that we work with because all of that data makes my work better, right? And all of those opportunities to put it in certain places make my work better. So I think we're going to have to, I think it might be forced a little bit, but creative agencies are going to have to get much, much closer. They're going to have to get faster at making content. They're going to have to be smarter about making content, um, and and essentially ev everything that we look at needs to go quickly, measured quickly, um, iterated quickly, adjusted quickly, and then take that learning into the into the next thing that we build. So I think speed. I think wearables definitely. I think that um, I think we. I think we're kidding ourselves if we have any uh, that we think we know exactly what what millennials want and that. You know, kids that have grown up on iPhones are going to be buying cars in five years, and and that's a that's that should be a really scary thing or an incredibly exciting thing because we're going to have to be marketing to somebody who grew up with nothing but you know a touchscreen and Wi-Fi and being connected to content all the time. So that's I mean I think it's crazy exciting, especially in China. I mean it's absolutely amazing over here. Tom, thanks for being on Thoughtful. We look forward to seeing you in the studio again. That wraps it up for today. Be sure to subscribe to us on Yoku, Tudo, and YouTube. And you can also follow us on Weibo, Twitter, and join our LinkedIn group. See you again.